welcome Conversations with Women Living Well After 50. Today we're talking about tummy troubles, bloating, pain, and what we can do to alleviate that and other symptoms such as irritable bowel syndrome. Anne Sinclair is the digestive detective. As a naturopath, she helps women purge the pain, beat the bloat, and gets to the root cause of their digestive issues by educating and empowering them to be their own digestive detective. For the last 10 years, Ange has been actively engaged in helping the community with their digestive issues through nutrition, herbal medicine, and supplementation. Today, as I mentioned, we're talking tummy troubles. So let's go and join the conversation. Welcome, Ange. It's lovely to have you join me again in conversation. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Sue. My pleasure. Now, tummy troubles. Many women, we can all relate to that. So I want to start by talking about the different symptoms that we might experience. So there's quite a few. Um, so some of the things I see often is being bloated. That's probably the number one. Constipation, diarrhea, uh, reflux or heartburn, some people call it. Hiccuping can be a symptom of um, gut dysbiosis, which just means imbalance. So there's, there's quite a few things that are a symptom I would say something that's unusual for you I would look at as a symptom for tummy trouble and it might you might not have any associated symptoms but if it's a change for you I think that's worth investigating mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you an example for example if you've spent most of your life as a person who's gone to the bathroom regularly with no constipation or diarrhea issues and now all of a sudden you are finding yourself more constipated or your stools are more liquid, that would be a cause for me to go, hmm, some investigation needed there. Um, because generally our digestive system shouldn't fluctuate so much that you would notice that happening. Mm. So they're the, probably the biggest things I would say. Okay. And so if we have those, would you recommend that we, we go to the doctor and, you know, is there any sort of testing available that we should be thinking about having or, or what we should be tested for? Yep. So for, for example, with the bloating, I think it's normal for all of us to bloat to some degree, um, especially after meals, but in, in a long-term thing. So if you're waking up bloated and you're getting more bloated as the day goes on and the bloating's not going away or um, you have um, a change in stool pattern like we just talked about, yes, I would definitely say go to the doctor. If you have things like um, a blood in your stool, that would be a really big thing for me to go. I think it's time to go to the doctor for a visit. It may not be anything, but it's worth getting that checked um, mm. before. So, you know, there's symptoms that happen for women over 50 that um, are, are really insidious you don't know that they're there. And, you know, one of those small digestive issues could be enough to alert you that something's going on. So I think it's always worthwhile going for a checkup, mm -hmm. um, even just to keep your mind at ease. You know, I think that it's something that we don't commonly think about it. And I think that it's something that we should probably think about more often. Yes. And I think many women, especially if they're going through menopause and, and, and after 50, um, you sort of just put up with things or you think, oh, well, bloating, that's just part of menopause or something like that. But it could be alleviated um, yeah. and a, a visit to the doctor or perhaps to someone like yourself um, uh, as a naturopath would be able to help us uh, overcome those uh, symptoms and, and just feel more comfortable. Yeah. And most of the time I'll send you to the doctor anyway, you know, mm. because I think it's a really nice baseline. I can tell a lot. And when you talked about testing and what, what should happen, I can tell a lot that's happening through blood tests because nutritional um, deficiencies can often show up in, in blood tests. Um, liver enzymes can be raised if there are um, things happening that shouldn't be happening. Um, liver enzymes can be raised if your bones are turning over really quickly. So they're, they're, it's a really good place to start. So I, I always like to send people off to the doctor. Um, and so some of the tests I recommend when you go to the doctor are things like um, a stool test, so a PCR stool test. So what that does, it tests for um, fragments of DNA from um, pathogens and bacteria. Um, so there's 10 of them that they check regularly for. 
um, like Giardia and Cryptosporidium and things like that. So I think that's worth doing. Um, it's hard to get right now during COVID because they're using the reagent for COVID testing. So, but that's one uh, when the world's normal that I would yeah. recommend you get um, a blood test, a normal blood test, and get things like um, full blood count, vitamin D, um, thyroid check, um, iron, B12, folate all those sort of cholesterol as we age, um, it's good to have a cholesterol marker. All those things we should probably be doing every two years anyway as a, as a woman's wellness check. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important because if we have a baseline, and I like to say to my clients at 45 or 50, go and get a baseline test yeah. because then you can see, um, you know, as we age, our inflammation can go up. And so it's really nice to be able to track that and make sure things aren't becoming inflamed, um, especially around menopause. Inflammation is a big part of all those symptoms that we have, you know, the hot flushes and um, the vaginal dryness and all of that. So if we can keep the inflammation low, we then don't, tend to have so many of those symptoms so mm. that's worth doing mm. I think. so going for a blood test and, and getting yeah. that baseline testing done yeah and so, i think it's always good to to have you know just the normal test so if if you haven't had a colonoscopy um it's worth doing that if if you've got um upper digestive issues like reflux or or heartburn or or, or chronic pain up higher i think it's worth having an endoscope um, just to rule out, you know, that there's nothing else happening. And I think if you did that um, once every three or four years, that the sort of endoscope colonoscopy, five years for a colonoscopy, um, mm. it's worth doing. Mm. Mm. And I think that we need to um, have that wellness plan in place. Uh, I think, as I said before, a lot of us just brush things aside or we tend to put up with it and don't, uh, don't do anything about it. But if we have a, um, a wellness plan, which you mentioned I think is a great idea because it can it can encompass our whole um, area of health and yeah. uh, if you if you sort of keep those testings up to date you can see you can catch anything that might be happening before yeah. it gets out of hand and 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 as you said it helps if someone comes to you you send them to the doctor for a test and then you've got that information that you can work with now um, I wanted to talk about food because that can play a, a big um, part in, in tummy troubles and the types of foods that we should be eating and those that perhaps we should be avoiding. So there's lots of foods to think about. Um, I think from, from a hormonal perspective for women over 50 and with gut too and um, I would like to see people more um, plant-based, not necessarily vegetarian, but more of their diet is made up from plant-based foods. Because what we know about um, gut bacteria and gut health is that um, those gut bacteria driven by the foods we eat, um, and not only by the foods we eat, but also of the colours of those foods we eat. So if you're doing a large diversity of fruit, nuts, um, vegetables, seeds and grains, um, beans and legumes, that gives you a really good um, bandwidth, I guess, of, of being able to include lots of different colours and lots of different types of foods into our diet. And I always suggest for really great gut health that we have um, around 30 to 40 different species of gut, uh, of diversity of food, of those foods every week. Um, and I often have people ask me, is there actually 30 different fruit and colored vegetables that we could eat? There it is. Mm. Um, the other thing too, I was just listening to an American uh, guru talk about that. And she's saying we should be eating between 50 and 70 different um, fruit and vegetables, nuts, grains and seeds a, a week. So that's pretty extraordinary amount. Um, but we know that those things those nutrients that we get and those phytochemicals we get from fruit and veg and nuts, grains, seeds, legumes and beans help us lower the inflammation in our body. So I think that it's really prudent that we that we have those, you know, as a, on a regular basis. We know that they feed our gut bacteria. So we know that they change the um, pH balance of our gut, which keeps us healthy. And so that not only helps with our gut, it helps with our declining hormones, it helps with our neurotransmitters um, that we need to make in our gut to be able to sleep better, to be emotionally stable, um, and all of those things. So I think it's really important that diet becomes sort of the focus of what's happening in our life. 
Mm, mm. And it also comes, I, I was reading a, actually one of your blog posts and you were talking about um, the fact that we actually need to think about not what, um, you know, apart from not what we're eating, we also need to think about the way we eat. Yes. And uh, I'd like to just touch on that if we could, because uh, it's something that, you know, mindful eating, you hear about that, but I'd like to just expand on that a little if we might. Yeah, well, I think it's a really important, once upon a time, and, and I think most people on this podcast will probably know, if anybody remembers Little House on the Prairie, remember they'd be out in the fields all day and they'd all come in for dinner and they'd wash their hands and they'd sit at the table and they'd hold hands and say grace. There's two reasons they were doing that. One, because they were saying grace. But the second reason is because when you're in the field or out doing things, you're in that fight or flight response, which is what has protected us as a species over millennia, basically. And that, um, that fight or flight thing, we constantly live in that state now, especially um, as we age, you know, women 40s, 50s to 60s, because we are, you know, looking after teenage children, we've, we've got busy in careers, um, or we work for ourselves. Um, we are busy looking after aging parents. So we are constantly juggling lots of different demands all the time. So we tend to be running from one thing to the other quite a lot. And we forget that, that when we go then to eat, we're still in that a movement mindset where we're still, you know, so that what that does is it, it raises our cortisol level, which is, and, and our adrenaline level, which is essentially what keeps us safe. The problem with that is the whole mechanism of that on our body is that once we tip that fight or flight switch, that tells the body to send all the blood away from our digestive system, to send it out to our arms and legs so we can run away or we can fight whatever this threat is. Um, so the problem with that is then the food that we've got sitting in our digestive system starts to ferment and that's when we get bloating and indigestion and burping and all of those gas and all those sorts of things because we're not actually breaking down the food. Um, and I see it often when I talk to people, well, what, what do you do for lunch? I eat it in the car between meetings um, and I get, I've got digestive symptoms all afternoon. So that's a real, um, uh, you know, problem for people who are trying to get into rest and digest is where we should be, that, that we are just focused on digesting food. You know, we, we've taken deep breaths down into our belly and we're just simply focused on the food that's coming because mindful eating um, in a way turns on those digestive enzymes. You know, so when we look at food, we get the message, wow, this is going to be great. And we start to um, that starts to gear up our salivary glands and stuff, then we actually start eating and that then our um, amylase in our mouth starts to break down those carbohydrates and turn on that whole digestive tract that we have, you know, right the way down. So food's ready to come in. And that's, we can only do that when we're in that space of rest and digest. So I think it's a really nice thing to try and do that often when we eat. Yes. I mean, we do live uh, very busy lives, even, people in retirement, uh, you know, you hear them saying, how did I have time to go to work full time? I'm just so busy. And um, I think that having even a family meal is just becoming more difficult because um, if you've got a family, the children are usually doing things after school, both parents might be working and it's sort of just grabbing what you can. So the days of having that lovely um, connection when you have the just wait for a minute. I just had a plane go over, so <laughs> I'll just edit this part out. Yeah, I don't know what that was. Okay, so um, I thought that's what I was saying. Yes, so the days of having that uh, traditional meal each, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, sitting down, having that time together as a family is just, I mean, you're lucky to get it once a week now, so for one mm. meal. So it's very important. And um, I think that the idea of making, whenever you can, I suppose, making the time to make that meal special, mm. I think in, in, in enjoying the preparation of the meal and then mm. not, not sort of rushing it, but really savouring the, the flavours and, and I know that I'm guilty of probably eating too fast, not chewing properly. 
and you mentioned that's a that's an issue as well that we just you know gobbling it down our food so quickly that we're not digesting it properly and i think the other thing is too we have these little mobile phone things that or we're at home and we're, we are tired after our day's work and we're sitting watching tv and just putting food into our mouth and and not taking any notice of what we're eating you know i'm sure there's lots of people listening that have sat down to eat a meal and they've been distracted by something else and actually looked down and think oh my god i finished i didn't even know and so that's one of the reasons that um we tend to have that weight gain creep because we essentially are we're not making any reference to what we're putting in our mouth so our brain's not getting that signal that we've chewed enough to be full uh, and so we just keep eating um, and, and and that's problematic so I, I urge people when that they are and when they can sit down to dinner um, to do sit down for dinner um, as a priority and that they take three really deep breaths into their belly so they can get out of that fight or flight state into rest and digest and then go through the other things like chewing um, make sure that they are actually um, really really chewing the food till it's liquefied basically um, because our digestive system does a third of the energy that we make our digestion takes up a third of that throughout the day so you want it to work efficiently when we when we're doing it so i think it's really important that they are simple things that we can fix that don't require too much intervention um, so I, I really like to start with those easy things first um, and so they're things that i think we that are really doable um, that we can do easily enough we've just got to put our mind to it mm. And many of us don't really have enough fiber in our diet. And of course, that's where, you know, the vegetables and that come in. But um, what are some other ways that we can um, incorporate or how much fiber should we be having? That's a great question. Um, and you're right. You're absolutely correct. Most people do not eat enough fiber. So just to be healthy, um, it's recommended that women eat 28 grams of fiber. That's not to prevent disease. That's just to be healthy. And so most of the people that I would see would eat somewhere between 12 and 15 grams of fiber a day, which mm. is not very much. No. You know, they're not they're not reaching the targets at all. So some of the things that I recommend to people to do in that circumstance is spend time um working out what you're going to have for the week for meals uh, you know put a bit of preparation into it and you don't have to stick with that but if you've got a little bit of a basic plan um that makes it a little bit easier when time comes to, to actually make the meal the other thing i would suggest too is um breakfast most people don't have any sort of vegetable fiber at breakfast and i think that's a really easy meal of the day to put stuff in and whether that's um, overnight oats or berries or um, asparagus or mushrooms with your eggs and stuff I think there's a lot of room to be able to do that um, I often look at breakfast and think what other vegetable can I add um, mm. rather than and I tend to do my meals a little bit different I always look at the vegetable component first and think well how many of these vegetables am I going to have and then what am I going to have for protein so mm. I sort of um, look at the end result that I want and then work backwards from there so and I think that's really important for people to try and add um, fruit and veg, nuts and seeds, grains as often as they can into yeah. their food. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And as you say, the planning, because also you can prep some of your meals ahead of time, especially if you're working full time or you're busy, and, and then at least that's done and it's, you, you know, you're going to have a nutritious meal. And getting all those um, the enough fiber and protein and carbs and everything, so that um, rather than grabbing a takeaway or or something that's not quite as healthy for us because we don't have the time to prepare. Yeah, it, and so. I, and it's funny. I often hear that. Oh, I'm so busy. Um, but truly, you can make a really decent meal in less than ten minutes. If oh you yes. Put some yeah. So, and I think, and I think people that's you know that's a go-to for some people but if you're really focused and and put your mind to it you could really make a decent um meal in in under 10 or 15 minutes mm. so. well a stir fry doesn't take long i mean the, the the longest part of that is just chopping up the vegetables and you could do a bit yeah. of prep on the weekend and just get the veggies ready and then it's not that that much to make them and i always think for us uh, my husband and i we can usually make a really lovely meal within half an hour. 
and that's from yes, way to go. Absolutely. And and so that that's not much. But as you say, 10 to 15 minutes and, and you can whip up something that's nutritious. So I think the key though is to having the ingredients there. So your point of planning and and making a shopping list of what you need and getting it in there rather than saying, oh, what's in the cupboard? I'm going to have to make yeah. this, or what's in the fridge? I'm going to have to make what it is in there. At least if you've got the ingredients, you at least you're halfway there. So, um, so the planning. And I think for me, I was not a very good cook. You know, I was a terrible cook actually. Um, I come from a corporate job, had no skills, lived on tuna at the end of the month because I never had any money. And so I had three children under three, and then I had to learn very quickly to cook things and so I used to plan out the meals um, that we'd have for a week and it would do a lot of things it cuts down on wastage you know exactly what you're eating um, mm. you can prepare the pieces of the meal beforehand or even the day before in some cases and you know there's been lots of studies done about food prep and prepping food you can actually you're more likely to eat fruit and veg out of your fridge that you've chopped up already um, and so I think that that's a really good thing to have on hand um, and having, you know, like your red cabbage already sliced and can be sitting in some water in the fridge, that'll last for 10 days. Uh, mm. So that's a really, they're sort of techniques to be able to utilise to be able to make you um, have more fruit and vegetables and things like that. I think they're little tiny steps that you can take every day to then create better ones. Um, yeah, and just talking about fruit and veg, um, what's your feeling about fresh versus frozen? I mean, I know that fresh is best, but um, with frozen, are you still getting the nutrients because yeah, it's well, not fresh, frozen? Yeah, well, there is some research that fresh is not necessarily no. best some cases because when it's snap frozen um that you you are really absolutely holding the nutrients in i don't have a preference over fresh or frozen i just have a preference for vegetables you mm. know i think it doesn't matter what they you know if they're a week or 10 days old then they're probably not going to be as nutritious as they would be to start with and maybe then if that's all you can do is get some frozen ones but i think having veg just having them you know, often people say to me, what are the best supplements? Well, the ones you take, um, and that's a bit the same like fruit and veg, the ones you eat are going to be the best ones for yeah. you and do it consistently. I say to people every day, you know, eat the vegetables, eat the fruit, nuts and seeds, um, beans and legumes. And that really holds your, and I've seen just simple things, that simple process, um, do remarkable things for people's bowel health and their, their digestive health, um, without them having to do too much and it is an effort at the start but it's those cumulative little things that you do day after day that really expand out into that really big result that you get at the end and mm. I think that's hard for people to get started but once you get momentum you can really see the benefits of it mm. and I think it's easy to get into a bit of a rush you might just buy the same things all the time but we're really fortunate especially here in Australia with the variety of um, fruit and veg that we have and uh, it's probably good to challenge yourself and step outside your comfort zone and try something new that might be in season and you think oh I haven't I don't even know what that is but yeah. um, developing your taste buds for something different and I think then that takes the monotony out of the same old same old meals that you're making which makes it all a little bit more of a pleasant experience and you you're just trying new things as well that's true and one of the things that I see in clinic Sue and I think this is really important for people to understand the people I see who have the biggest digestive problems are the people who eat the same foods every day mm. you know the people who say to me I don't need to fill out a food diary because I eat the, exactly the same for breakfast the same for lunch and pretty much the same for dinner because what happens in that circumstance is we know that there's um that we have a, a, a whole lot of bacteria in our gut and we know what feeds them and we know that those colours that we talked about, um, you know, there's there's six colours that I try and get people to eat all the time. We know that they feed our gut bacteria. So if you're just feeding a tiny, narrow little segment, you are going to come up against um, problems because you're not feeding all that good gut bacteria that you could be. And 
each different bacteria makes um, certain metabolites which, which benefit us. Like some of them make our B vitamins, which give us energy. So if you're not feeding those gut bacteria with the food you eat, you're not going to be able to produce the energy that you need to do the things that you need to do in your daily life. Mm. Um, and so sort of explaining it to people like that, they tend to... Um, twig better that you know i do need to eat variety so that's a really important thing for me if you can only do one thing out of everything that we talk about that would be getting diversity i have a little trick i say to my clients hear me in your ear when I, when you're at the fruit and vegetable shop so if you're about to grab that red capsicum that you buy every single time get an orange one get a green one try the black ones if you see them if you always buy white cabbage buy the red one um, mm. Because it's those, it's those small incremental little changes that make the hugest difference to your gut bacteria. And mm. it's amazing to see people go, I've never tried that before. That's really great that I've now tried that and I've liked it. And I've had people say, oh, I didn't like it. And I say, well, don't give up on it because even children, we know it takes children nine times tasting something to like it with adults. It yeah. can very well be the same. Mm. Um, so try it a couple of times before you give up on it. Mm. But that's an interesting point. I, I didn't, when I was talking about the variety, I didn't think um, of how it would, you know, the bacteria, mm. feeding the bacteria and that sort of thing. So I was thinking more about just making your meals a little bit more exciting. But yeah, there's that, uh, there's that other side to it as well. So um, what are the other symptoms we could be looking out for that might not be food related, but we're getting those tummy issues there's a couple and one of them was chewing which we talked about before because when you're chewing or if you're um for example chewing gum is a, is a really good one, example so chewing gum stimulates your digestive system to turn on mm -hmm. so what happens if you chew gum you're turning your digestive system on and it's working and there's no food coming down so that continual um you know food going down so that's one thing um if you don't chew properly you're not breaking that food down we talked about. If you drink and eat at the same time, so if you're having a glass of water as you have your dinner or your lunch or something, that tends to dilute your digestive enzymes and your hydrochloric acid. So you don't break that food down effectively mm -hmm. as you would, um, which can then lead to bloating and indigestion and all those things. The other thing I would say too on that, there was one other thing, it's just popped out of my head now. Um, so we've got chewing gum, chewing um oh it's gone Bugger. i can't think of it <laughs> can you tell me ask me the question again oh yeah um what uh, uh what are the other symptoms we should be looking out for that might not be food related okay so chewing is is one um bloating a change in hormones you know if, if you're really not feeling in yourself that mm -hmm. can be problematic you know if you can't manage your emotions how you would normally do that can be problematic that can be a sign that your gut's off um if you go from being a person that sleeps normally to somebody that's then struggling to get to sleep or stay asleep that could be problematic that can be gut related um any sort of and i've had an interesting conversation with another naturopath today we were talking about menopause and she was talking about pain. And I've seen this with clients, whereas if you're um, taking in the wrong things that that can cause pain in your body. So if you have a higher level of pain that could be associated with something happening in your gut. So they're all things to look out for. Mm. Um, they're the main ones. Yeah, yeah. So um, any, any foods we should be avoiding? Oh, look, I say there will be some for different people they're not necessarily the same for everybody you know like seems like every second person I talk to is on FODMAP um, and I think with those sorts of really restrictive diets they are short-term diets they're mm. diets that we're not supposed to be on and I often hear people say oh my gastroenterologist said I can be on it for 10 years well they're not reading the literature and the the research shows that they are six to eight week diets 12 weeks at the very most because they start to damage your bowel um, so that would be important um, to find out what foods that you are having problem with. And that's why it's really good to work with somebody because they can work you through an elimination diet if you need to, so you can find out what foods um, are, 
are reacting to. I find one of the most common things that I see are people bloated and from uh, um, dysbiosis, which means imbalance in their bacteria. Um, and I liken it to like a car space. So there's six car um, parking spots in our garage and three of those are good bacteria and three of them are bad bacteria. And when our gut becomes very unbalanced, um, the bad bacteria might take over five of those spaces and only leave one for good. So that's when we'll start to notice all these things happening to us. We might get a rash, we might get acne that we've never had before. Um, we might get pain, which we talked about, all those sorts of things. So that's worth then thinking, well, something's going on for me, then what do I do next? And that's worth talking to somebody about what's actually going in your mouth um, and, and treating that imbalance first and then coming back to the foods as a secondary portion of that yeah. because sometimes it just we just need the bacteria to come back to normal um, and then you'll you'll see a change mm. so I want to talk um, just we're, we're going to be finishing soon but I, I'd like to uh, talk about your role as a naturopath and um, if someone wants to see you do they need a referral or do, can they just make an appointment uh, are you taking um, online uh, virtual um, appointments, that sort of thing? And, and what would the first meeting generally look like? Okay. So, so as, as a naturopath, I do a couple of things. So I help people find the foods that they um, have problem with. I help them rebalance that gut bacteria. I do a lot around restoration of guts because we know that things like antibiotics, one round of antibiotics that you take for a course of a week will damage your gut bacteria for up to four years and can be longer and some species will become extinct. So I help people restore that because it's not only the antibiotics, it's the other medications we take, it's the stuff we put on our skin, it's the, um, you know, like this craze with people ingesting essential oils, that um, really disrupts our gut microbiome and it causes us damage internally. So, so getting people, teach people strategies to, to make their environment safe for them. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to do that. Um, as a virtual, I'm actually a virtual um, practitioner at the minute mm -hmm. um, just due to COVID. And so normally I offer a free 15 minute because I like to chat to people to make sure that we're a match before you spend yeah. that money to come and see me. Um, and I love to know, be able to say to you, yes, I can definitely help you with that. Um, or no, I can't, but I can recommend this person would be a better yeah. fit for you for that. So that's sort of how I work. So I ask people to, to book in for a free 15 minute call. Um, and so we can chat about that. So I can give you a bit of an action plan. Well, you've talked to me about this is happening. You should go to the doctor first and these are what you need to ask for. And once you get those, then book in to me or whoever else I've suggested. Um, that's sort of where I like to go. And in the first consultation, basically I talk about, well, I don't talk at all very much. You talk and tell me um, what's happening for you when it started, why it's happening. I do a lot about your family history. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot about things that have happened in your life, for example, I see a lot of people who have had about a food poisoning um, 30 years ago and never been quite right since. Um, and so that tells me that there's something changed in their microbiome and in their gut. Um, and that could be a parasite that's been living there for 30 years. Um, so I do do a lot of those sorts of things. And mm. then in the second consultation, I because I have a package of two, um, in the second consultation, we do lots and lots of stuff about diet, how, how we've just talked about the colors and stuff. I teach you which foods feed your gut bacteria um, and which are the better foods for you to have and do it in a sequence of this is where you are today and this is how you incrementally get there by doing this every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real education. So, And then I say to you, I probably don't need to see you for four to six weeks because I want you to go out and do things on your own to see where that gets to. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if you need me, you come back. But you know, I, I like to educate people for, for it to be sustainable for them that they can go on and be um, their own digestive detective, basically, and they can see the changes. We talk a lot about poo um, as well. So because the, the, the way your bowel works, um, the quality of your stool that you produce, um, whether it sinks or floats or smells or how much you fart, all those sorts of things, they're all conversations that we have. 
Mm. Um, not everybody loves those conversations. I love them. Um, but it's a really good indicator of our health, essentially. Yes. And I think we probably um, all are a bit squeamish about that. And I think that sometimes that gets, that sometimes that makes people leave their problems longer than they should have. Mm, yeah, they don't feel comfortable talking about certain subjects and, and we've yeah. really just got to get over it because all those things are just the natural part of life, the way our bodies yeah. function and perhaps maybe shouldn't be functioning in certain things and that's what you're there to find out. So um, I just want to cover quickly, you are starting up a challenge, um, Beat the Bloat. What, what's that about? So the Beat the Bloat challenge is we've talked about food today. So the Beat the Bloat challenge are some of the things we've talked about too today about things that are not food related that which would help um, with bloating. Uh, you know, and, and some of the tips that you can do around those things to, to make them, make sure that they're not the thing causing your bloating. So with bloating, I always like to say to people, is it what you're eating to start with? Are you, you know, so for example, the classic one is beans for me. People always go, beans bloat me. Well, beans bloat you because you don't eat them often enough. You know, you should be having beans three or four times a week. Um, and when people do buy beans, they go and have a big bowl of burrito or something, a naked burrito bowl, which is full of beans, which beans really feed our good gut bacteria. So that fills them up with, um, that's like an overfeeding of these poor little bacteria. They fill with gas. Um, they let the gas go, which in turn fills us up with gas. So I like to say to people, we start there with that, food we eat, then the way we eat, are we sitting down? Are we um, in that rest and digest phase when we eat it? And the next part of that is, do we have the digestive fire? As we age, we lose those digestive enzymes. And that can be from not only um, our hydrochloric acid getting lower, but our digestive enzyme starts to, to get lower as well. Um, and also if there's any diseases like celiac disease or any pancreatic problems, that stops us from being able to make those digestive enzymes as well. So they're the things that we need to do. Um, and we all know it's, it's classic, um, as people get older, the old people that eat tea and toast, that's because they're not hungry anymore. And that's because mm. they've lost that digestive enzyme. And there's plenty of things that we can do now as we age to help um, with those digestive enzymes so we can go into, the, into our future and be able to eat and digest all the foods that we eat um and that are that are the foods that are good for us so i think they're the they're the first three and the fourth one i'd say is um a bacterial imbalance that we talked about before if you've got more good if you've got more bad bacteria than you've got good bacteria it's really hard for your digestive system to do the job that it's supposed to and so that might need a bit of tweaking here and there to get it back to balance mm. um and so they're all the things they're the four things that i would say first um, there's a couple of things in there. Exercise, we didn't talk about that. That's a real pillar of how um, well your digestion works. You know, that exercise really helps digestion. So that, that needs to be included into the mix as well. So there's mm. lots of things that, are, that you can do to improve um, bloating without it being food related. Mm. So that's what I'm going to teach for the week. Okay, that sounds good. So I'll put the links to that in the show notes and people can uh, follow through to there and, can, and contact you. Um, so before we leave, and it's been lovely chatting today, and I know that you're going to be a regular on the show, so I'm really happy about that. And we'll be talking uh, more about um, all things to do with our digestion and the way we eat in the future. Uh, so in closing today, I, I'd like to ask you a question that I ask all of my guests, and that is, what does being a woman living well mean to you? Oh, that's a good question. And I think for me, it's about having really good self-care. I think um, as we age and, and heading towards menopause, I think that we don't really, because there's so much happening in our life, we don't actively engage in taking care of ourselves well. Mm. Um, and I think that's problematic for a lot of people. Um, that's one of the reasons menopause is, is not always necessarily a great experience for people because we're, our bodies are already um, overextended, uh, stressed, inflamed. That tends to 
be problematic. So I, for me, I think being moving every day, it's a non-negotiable for me. Yeah, it has to, I have to move every single day. And whether that's as simple as a yin yoga or going for a really um, walk or Pilates or something like that, every day I do something. Um, spending really good quality time with my husband um, and my family, mostly my husband, um, but taking care of myself, really going out uh, uh, and doing things that I need to do that will nurture me. And that's been a real journey for me. Uh, it's been one of those things that probably I didn't do enough until I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's. Um, so I, I really take the time, even in my business, I, I make sure I start later in the day, like I start at 10 o'clock rather than at, at, at seven or eight o'clock. So that gives me time to do the things that I need to do to make my life forward, the life that I want to, um, you know, that I want to leave. So um, that's, that's what I think, you know, living well after 50 looks like. So, mm -hmm. and, and I totally agree. And, and I think that we're all, um, you know, we go through that thing where we feel the guilt about having time mm -hmm. for ourselves. We've just got to get over that because we're individuals. We are uh, just as important as um, anyone else that we're caring for. And I always say that self-care is self-respect. And so if you don't respect yourself and your body and, and, and your needs and desires, then you can't expect other people to be respecting you as well. So it's so important. And I think that, um, unfortunately, you know, it starts to become a buzzword or something and people switch off and, and go, oh, self-care, I've heard all about that. But it is so important because... At the end of the day, it's we've only got one life, haven't we? Mm. And whilst we want to care for family and friends, we've got to also care for ourselves. So I think that's an excellent answer and um, and one that uh, we can all take to heart. So is is there anything else you'd like to add today? No, look, I I, I, I listen to the aeroplane quote, and I and it's well used now yeah. as well, but. I think you can't help anybody else unless you've got your own oxygen mask on. And for some of us, me, it took a really long time to learn that. And mm. I think once you get it, though, you can't. It's like I do a little example with um, clients on their day diary and I get them to circle the fruit and vegetables so they can see what colours they're eating. When you see it, you can't unsee it. So it's the same when you see that self-care, what it does for you and how you feel in yourself, in your body, in your mind you can't then go back to the way you lived before. It's an impossibility. So mm. I think that's a really good thing to remember to, to every day, do something for yourself. Yeah, um, yep. perfect. And a perfect way to finish. So for the listeners, uh, don't forget, I'll be leaving the links to Angie's uh, website and her social media links and for the challenge. Uh, in the show notes. And if you've enjoyed today's program, I'd love you to share it with a friend who uh, would benefit from the topic that we've talked about today, because I know that most of us have, have or do suffer from tummy troubles from time to time. And uh, if you've enjoyed the episode, I'd, I'd love you to uh, leave me a review and a like and, and subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss a conversation. So thanks again, Ange, for uh, joining us today and uh, talking about tummy troubles and, and giving us some great tips there. It's been lovely to have you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I look forward to our next conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward to uh, you all joining us again for my next conversation. And in the meantime, remember to embrace and enjoy life every day. Bye for now. Thanks.